start and uh, welcome everyone this evening. Um, it is June 4th, 2020. And um, I feel like every, in the last few weeks, every time uh, we meet and I see everyone, uh, the world has uh, changed more and um, we have new things to talk about. So we started using Zoom as a result of the coronavirus and stopping the uh, in-person um, services and classes at the temple. And we went um, completely virtual, which I think has been a huge help so that everyone could stay connected and we continue uh, to offer the Dharma. Um, however, one of the uh, downsides, I guess, is uh, physical contact has been possible and you know the way we engage with one another I think it's just um, just as helpful or as important to have actual human contact and um, you know foster conversation amongst ourselves as it is to uh, engage with the text so I, I think we're, we're missing that part sadly um, so if questions do come up please let me know if you have thoughts um, that you want to share with everyone, uh, please do. Um, it's not the same as uh, sharing a meal after the service, uh, certainly not as tasty, and we don't get uh, to sample everyone's uh, cuisine and offerings and all the things they brought, uh, healthy and unhealthy, um, but at least uh, for a little while we can see each other and um, we can still, you know, we still have, we have this, given everything that's going on. So um, I mentioned that we started off uh, with the coronavirus. I think um, if that were not a factor, given world events, we'd probably still be meeting online. Um, we're here in Portland. Um, I can actually hear some demonstrations outside my window. And I know um, given the past few nights in the state, curfew, traffic, demonstrations, um, you know, I think it's highly likely that people would have asked for this um, anyway, or they might not be present because they're um, out in the streets. So I just want to recognize our current situation. And um, I've been contacted by a lot of people. Um, the events of the world are heavy on their mind. Um, some people are having a really hard time carrying on daily tasks. I think this has been more impactful for many people than um, you know, the coronavirus and uh, the world and their da daily schedule changing. Um, I've heard from people that are uh, shocked by what they see on TV. They're, other people are more shocked by what they hear people saying or the response and even more people who are maybe double or triply shocked by the response to the response. So um, I just want to recognize that we may all have different uh, responses or feelings, um, but probably um, we're all feeling something. So um, I just want to start off recognizing that. So depending on where we are in, um, in the world, it may affect us differently. Um, and we may respond differently, but um, this is definitely a unique time. Um, I, don't, I don't think that in the middle of the Spanish influenza, they also had massive social unrest. I may be wrong. Um, I haven't read up a lot about that time, but this is pretty unique, so. Um, what I'm gonna try to do tonight is um, point out how this part of the text can actually be helpful or insightful for the world in which we live. So I think more and more it's helpful to draw connections between uh, this text that comes to us from the 400s and things that are going on right now in 2020. So um, I think the Buddhist teaching, one of the reasons why it's so relevant and necessary is um, because it's timeless. But how timeless it is may not be immediately obvious and it helps to 
point that out and really draw those connections. And I think that helps us understand what the teaching is all about. Um, when I was younger and first became Buddhist, I was often criticized by people. Um, and they felt that the Buddhist teaching wasn't really responsive to uh, things in our world. And they felt like um, it was a, an easy way out, right? That they didn't see uh, direct engagement. And I really thought about that criticism when I was younger. And um, I thought there was some merit to it. And I, I said, well, I, I, I agree. I don't see you know, large um, relief agencies that are Buddhist themed or inspired. I don't see, uh, you know, Buddhist feeding the homeless. And I thought, well, why is that? Um, then I reflected a little bit more and I said, well, there, there aren't any Buddhist temples in my area, so they wouldn't be doing that. And um, the ones that uh, were present, you know, in the, in the greater, you know, tri-state or four or five state area um, were incredibly small compared to other organizations. Um, and as I got involved in um, more in the study of Buddhism and, and engaged other Buddhist groups, I found in fact that they were doing a lot of that work. They just did it quietly. They didn't uh, pat themselves on the back about it afterwards. They didn't um, seek out recognition for what they had done. Um, so when I got to college, I actually became part of uh, the Taiwanese group uh, Ziji, and it's the Compassion Relief Organization, and we did a lot in the community around East Lansing, around Michigan State University, um, visiting um, elder homes and all a variety of different kind of social engagement. So it exists. Um, it has a different model. It has a different type of engagement, but I think there's a lot that we can learn um, from Ziji. Um, I think a great example is they've been very instrumental in uh, tsunami relief in South and Southeast Asia. And their model is to be there from the beginning to the end. So not just um, the immediate relief, you know, handing out supplies and temporary housing, but they stayed for years and years until the entire community was rebuilt. People had jobs. So their relief organization constantly changed as people's needs changed. Um, and I thought that was really unique because I think a lot of, a lot of relief organizations are sort of maybe more pinpoint focused. Um, they have a very, very specific um, mission statement. Um, you know, we're gonna do vaccinations, we're gonna do this. Um, we're dedicated to clean water and that's really good. But I think one of the um, takeaways from the Buddhist model that was pioneered by Ziji was, um, you know, understanding that people aren't made whole until they are, they're truly completely back on their feet. Their home is, is rebuilt. Um, you know, they have a job again. They're able to provide for their families. So to that degree, um, Ziji actually has its own farms and um, warehouses. So they can actually farm the food that they provide. So they're not dependent they really analyzed, you know, where their weaknesses were, um, where they might be dependent on other organizations. Um, so it was a much broader uh, view. And I think that view of crisis is really helpful. So um, I was thinking a lot about that model when um, I was reading or rereading re this part of the Awakening of Faith. And contemplating things going on in the world around us and um, how we can actually effectively change things for the better um, and not only uh, focus on our own spiritual development. So I think something that's really key in Buddhist practice is if we're only focused on our own spiritual development, we're doing it wrong. The, um, the, Bodhisattva path has a lot to do with ensuring that we have other people's needs and suffering in mind. Um, and not just having it in mind, that's, that's our starting point, but um, that we make that our focus. So um, I don't think it's possible to study a text like this and talk about compassion 
without really being aware of everything going on in the world around, about, around us and talking about solutions. So um, we'll do a little bit of very traditional study and we'll do a little bit of my, um, my modified application to um, what's going on in the world. So um, with that, I see other people have joined, so thank you. And we'll start reading again. Um, I think for everybody's benefit, the screen sharing is helpful so we can read along in the text together. So I'll share that part of the text. Um, so this is where we begin on the PDF, it's page 29. So I'll read from there. Um, that the deluded mind and consciousness arise from the permeation of ignorance is something that ordinary people cannot understand. The followers of the Hinayana and their wisdom likewise fail to realize this. Those bodhisattvas who, having advanced from their first stage to correct faith by setting the mind upon enlightenment through practicing contemplation, have come to realize the Dharmakaya and partially comprehend this. Yet even those who have reached the final stage of bodhisattvahood cannot fully comprehend this. Only the enlightened ones, Buddhas, have thorough comprehension of it. Why? The mind, though pure in its self-nature from the beginning, is accompanied by ignorance. Being defiled by ignorance, a defiled state of mind comes into being. But though defiled, the mind itself is eternal and immutable. Only the enlightened ones are able to understand what this means. What is called the essential nature of mind is always beyond thoughts. It is therefore defined as immutable. When the one world of reality is yet to be realized, the mind is mutable and is not in perfect unity with suchness. Suddenly, a deluded thought arises. This state is called ignorance. So if you find that passage puzzling, uh, first, the text makes clear that only the enlightened ones are able to understand what this means. So don't feel bad. Um, we shouldn't uh, have any sort of, uh, gosh, this is really terse. I'm not sure if I understood. Um, so why, why do we have a, a passage like this? It's not here to be paraded in front of us as some sort of unobtainable knowledge that you only get when you're enlightened. Um, what is meant is that if we're trying to understand certain aspects of the Buddhist teaching with the, using the deluded mind, right? Using the, the logic focused, object focused, discriminating mind, our everyday mind, um, this mind that we have right now, um, using that mind, we're not gonna be able to understand. So the text is telling us we need to do a little bit of work before we can fully comprehend what is meant. And this is where it draws distinctions that um, those practicing contemplation have come to realize the Dharmakaya can partially comprehend this, right? So we have some insight. Um, those who have reached the final stage of bodhisattvahood, there's still something yet that differentiates the bodhisattva from a Buddha. So we have to recognize that with um, with any aspect of um, unenlightenment, right? With any aspect of um, ignorance remaining, then there's going to be some part of the teaching that we're not going to have full insight into. So it's just, I think, laying out. Um, that kind of key core component and um, letting us know that. So I think there was a question. Yeah, that was me. I, I hope I didn't break your uh, train of thought with that little oh. hand icon. No, I can't can you, uh, here, so that's good. Use them, that's good. <laughs> can you uh, define Dharmakaya? Yes, the Dharmakaya is um, considered that sort of immutable um, original enlightened nature. So sometimes um, referred to as something inside all of us or as um, kind of the original state of either the universe or that which we're trying to realize through meditation or meditative practice. 
So in Qinggong specifically, um, oftentimes the Dharmakaya is something that we're trying to uh, unite with in ritual meditation. So when we're contemplating um, Dainichi, we're actually contemplating this uh, Dharmakaya. So the sutras are clear that all Buddhas are enlightened to the same thing. Um, they are enlightened to this original same nature. And um, that is described or labeled or termed the Dharmakaya. So that's one way to look at it. But from the standpoint of um, what the text is talking about here, that's, that's kind of what it's discussing. Thank you. I usually uh, make it a point to define our, our Chinese and Sanskrit terms, and I, I failed to do that this time. So. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Is that this then is Dharmakaya the same thing as one mind? I'm sorry, I missed the. Uh, oh, is the Dharmakaya book. the same thing as one mind? It, it as can be depending the on the usage. Um, sometimes, and again, this is like a translation problem. Similar terms may be translated in unusual ways or ways that aren't clear. So we don't have, as English speakers, we don't have um, a coherent set of, of agreed upon terms in the same way that um, the Chinese translators did. So they're always, always using terms the same way. Sometimes um, the one mind is referring to our original nature. And from a Xingguang perspective, you could say that, yes, it would be the same as the Dharmakaya or realizing um, unity with the Dharmakaya. Um, in other schools of Buddhism, when it said that, sometimes they're referring to um, samadhi, the deep state of meditation, or the dhyanas, so the um, realization of the um, similar levels of consciousness or of minds that are equivalent to the highest levels of the heavens. So it's incredible stillness, um, not having any distractions in mind, yet may still be um, not quite enlightened. However, um, in the Dikhyanas, much more of this teaching is understandable because we're not using our um, mind that's still colored by ignorance or which still discriminates. Um, for example, no matter how much I meditate, I don't like raw tomatoes. I do not prefer them. Um, and of course, during my training uh, in Sacramento, we, you know, Sacramento is Sacra Tomato, so surrounded by tomato fields. Um, so we had a lot of members of the temple that farm tomatoes, and we'd often get donations of tomatoes. So the one thing I didn't prefer, we had an abundance of. <laughs> so what did we eat? Um, you know, after lots of meditation, tomatoes. What did we have for lunch? You know, with every dish, tomatoes. Um, what was, what were we offering, you know, on the altar sometimes often tomatoes, um, and un unconsciously, you know, even though I'm like offering very, you know, sincerely, I was making a face. <laughs> so I had to learn, um, this is the distinction, but in meditation, I, I forget about this, this discriminating mind of mine that just made distinctions between, um, you know, wonderful, fresh uh, ripe fruit that I label tomato and the other that I label, you know, uh, apple, which I love. <laughs> so the only difference is my mind. Um, so that is something that we can, um, for a time be free of, but it requires practice. So I, I, there is a, there is an effort underway to, um, have a more unified translation system for Buddhist texts that everyone can agree to, but we, we're not there um, yet, unfortunately. But I do, I do follow the progress, and I'm I'm hopeful we'll we'll be there eventually. So. Um, but thank you for the questions. Don't don't worry about my train of thought, please. If you have it, question ask. Um, so the mind, I think the, the part of the point of the passage here telling us only the Buddhas understand is um, first, to, this is an area that 
is fascinating for philosophical inquiry. Um, this is the kind of passage that I think, um, this is always my example, right? You, you put some John Coltrane on and you sit back in the evening and you sit with friends and you, you know, you talk about the deep truths of the world. Um, and, um, this is one of those things that could be, um, you know, a, a 10 hour conversation that you remember for uh, a long time. Um, and you start wondering, you know, well, what is our original state? Uh, where does this a mind come from? Um, how is it that it's permeated by ignorance from the beginning? Um, what's the origin of ignorance? Um, as Kolodaishi famously said, um, sentient beings don't know where they've come from and they don't know where they're going. Um, and living beings have no answer to this question. So the focus of practice is um, quite broad. I think the purpose that Asvagosha has here, and this is my, my shot at explaining, um, is that this runs dangerously close to the kind of famous areas of questioning that the Buddha didn't answer. And he didn't answer because he thought they would be distractions. It would just be sophistry. So this is one of the reasons why it's avoided. But what he's telling us isn't, you're not enlightened, you'll never understand. It's more, um, we have to be careful what mind we're bringing to the puzzle. Are we bringing our practice mind or are we bring a meditative mind or are we bringing um, you know, a mind that wants to find fault? Are we bringing a mind that's very set in its ways? Are we bringing you know, a deluded mind? So um, our logical, the mind we're using right now is not the right one. Um, so I think that's our, our clear takeaway. Um, so Yes. Uh, can you give me the Shingon uh, distinction between uh, the uh, defiled and undefiled? Oh, that's a good one. Um, from a Shingon perspective, um, well, I guess I should start with the, the, the Sutra perspective. So from a Mahayana perspective, um, defiled and undefiled are distinguished partially so that we know what proper ethical behavior is. And the reason and purpose for the ethical behavior is to challenge our assumptions and the how we're living. So if we, um, is, they're not rules just for rules. The rules to get us to contemplate um, when we desire to break the rule, why is that? What's the real underlying issue or impetus for that desire? Um, so for example, if we say we're not going to take intoxicating beverages, it's not that, um, you know, a drop of wine is somehow, um, uh, antithetical to the Buddhist teaching. It's why are we reaching for the wine? It's to make us question, are we reaching for it? Because it's a Chinese medicinal herb that's, um, uh, you know, distilled into an alcohol or is used as a, you know, preservative or that's the way you take it or are we reaching for it because we're stressed out because we want to avoid things because we want to forget so um when we generally from a kind of a sutra perspective talk about defiled and undefiled we're drawing this distinction between what's helpful for our progress in the path and what isn't uh shingon has a bit of a more radical perspective um and so in the um, Rishikyo, the Prajnaparamita Naya Sutra, the perspective may be more along the lines of rather than make distinctions between defiled and undefiled, except that defiled and undefiled exist all the time, and just try to stop making distinctions between them. See that they're both part of our same reality. See that they're both part of ourselves. And um, by doing that, um, we could potentially break through the real obstacle of why we make these distinctions. So there's a danger in, um, not always, but there's, a, there's an inherent danger 
in ethical practice, when we, when we lay out a series of ethical principles, a human being will automatically start to look around and say, well, who isn't following the rules and what's wrong with them? You know, I'm better than this other person because I follow the rules or I'm doing it the right way. You're doing it the wrong way. So there's this kind of, um, small mindedness often that sets in. So there is a way, uh, a method of practice to kind of break through that or the, um, esoteric practice, the, what, what we call Vajrayana conveniently or mantra practice, the mantra vehicle, sometimes scholarly reference. Tibetan and, and Shingon practice are, um, can we, rather than making such clear distinctions and starting to parse out every part of behavior, can we just sort of run more quickly to our goal, right? Can we practice so hard that we forget about these minor distinctions? And, um, you know, if you watch the Goma, right, consume the defilement instantly. So that's a different perspective. So Shingon has this, um, this practice, this method. Um, there's pitfalls to that method too. Um, so whenever you, we just had SpaceX launch, um, you know, going that fast and that straight, that comes with inherent dangers, but it gets you higher faster. So, so our astronauts are much, much higher. They're moving much quicker. They're able to do experiments you can't do on an airplane. Um, an airplane's much safer, <laughs> but it's not going to get to the same place at the same rate. Um, so what method you use all depends on um, how much training, preparation, um, readiness you have. So I, I would suspect that, you know, a commercial airline pilot doesn't have the same training as an astronaut. Um, I would suspect that even though Boeing, well, I know for, for a fact, I, I have friends and family that work for Boeing. <laughs> so I, I know for a fact that the engineers that work on, you know, 777 are very different from the engineers that work on um, the space programs. So um, the, the problems that they confront are different. So um, this is, I think, what's left out of perhaps a lot of the Shingon discussion, scholarly or popularly, is that um, if you're going to attempt to burn up the unhelpful components that are in the mind, the defiled states, um, it requires more work, more uncomfortable work than the sutra pr perspective. Um, so instead of only reciting the sutra and bowing, um, you may do austerities and retreats that involve much more um, much more suffering <laughs> to kind of break through those those states. So um, in actuality, those practices exist in non-esoteric schools. They just are not widely taught. Um, so there are retreats for that. They're, they're widely practiced in what's often referred to as um, orthodox Buddhism, like in Taiwan and the Chinese schools. So outwardly, those schools present as um, you know rigorous sutra, teaching and study and Zen, Zen meditation. For a select few, they actually have very intensive retreats that are um, esoteric in nature, but there's additional preparation before you go in. And there's actually teachings on how you actually come out of the retreat. So you won't find that um, in written instruction. But um, I've, I've, I've been present in the lectures where you know, those monks are talking um, about those practices. So it's present in all the schools. Um, just what is the major focus would be different. So hopefully that, that helps a little bit.
Um, so I'm going to maybe skip down. We have this wonderful translator's note that um, I like these translator's notes. So I'll try not to belabor it, but um, it's discussing the uh, translation of um, the text. And it really gives a very good description here of how we should understand um, this last passage. So um, the last passage here says, what is called the essential nature of mind is always beyond thoughts. It is therefore defined as immutable. When one world of reality is yet to be realized, the mind is mutable and is not in perfect unity with suchness. Suddenly, a deluded thought arises. This state is called ignorance. So the translator's note here focuses on, um, from the original Chinese, uh, Huran. And uh, Huran literally means to neglect or overlook. Um, and so it has the, the sense of something happening very quickly or suddenly. So if you overlook something, um, it's probably happening without your, your conscious awareness. That may be a better or more clear understanding for us. Um, and the translator's note here is saying, trying to distinguish what is meant by suddenly a deluded thought arises, the state is called ignorance. And it makes um, farther down um, in this commentary, it makes the distinction of, um, or gives the example of dust accumulating on a mirror. And it says, the enlightened mind and ignorance exist simultaneously. But almost instantly, ignorance arises. And the later translators are trying to struggle with what does that mean and, and how is it that ignorance arises suddenly. And if you go farther down here in the um, text, there's an example that says, the monk of Ming China name, uh, Chen Jie, in his commentary to the Awakening of Faith written in 1599, glosses suddenly as uh, Wu Jue, which means unconsciously or without being aware of the reason. Um, and farther down in this translator's note, it makes the example of this sort of dust falling on a mirror, meaning, and I think giving us the impression that um, Ignorance happens when we stop working. Um, ignorance arises when we, uh, we neglect our mind. So um, in other parts of the sutras, you'll find, you know, what is it to be a Buddha? And they describe Buddhas as being constantly in meditation. Um, and I was reading this passage and thinking, oh, perhaps it's referring to or distinguishing our way of being from the Buddha's way of being, where the Buddha is always aware of what's going on in their mind, and we're not. So the minute that we get up from meditation, uh, the dust begins to settle again, and ignorance arises. So partially, we have to constantly do work to keep the mirror free of dust. We have to constantly do work to keep our minds clear. Um, but I think this kind of gives some hints as to how it is that ignorance arises. And we're being told that um, perhaps initially we're not even aware of the process, right? The mind's enlightened, but we're not aware of this propensity for the dust to fall and settle. And over time we forget. And perhaps enlightenment is this um, clawing our way back to that original state once we realize once we've been through that process, we continue, continue to do practice to keep it clean. But in our state currently, um, it's something that we need to constantly be aware of and constantly work on. So um, we, we get thrown a couple uh, uh, Chinese words. The other one that was mentioned there, the Bu Jue, unconsciously um it's sort of talking about our 
underlying delusion that we have that is the the source of our ignorance all the things that we're subconsciously not aware of um everything that's happening to us all the things that we're taking in um for me at the moment i'm you know my my mind is taking in the the sounds of a distant protest but i'm not maybe consciously aware of everything they're saying because i'm not focused on it but i still hear it so these things build up over time when no attention is given um I think in our current state of affairs in the world, um, I think it's fair to, at least from my perspective, um, think about race and racism. Um, I don't think anyone wakes up with the intent of today I'm, I'm going to become a racist or um, I'm going to, you know, act out ethnic violence. I think it's a slow, it's a slow buildup of social and um, societal comments, behavior and families and communities, and um, we're not aware of them. And eventually we start to form opinions. And when our community acts, we also act. And we start to lay down new pathways um, and those lead to violence. So our resistance to um, you know, acting on those subtle impulses breaks down over time. So in my opinion, I don't, I don't think anyone starts off that way. I haven't seen any, you know, little kids that, you know, on the playground as toddlers or somehow have these ingrained beliefs. Um, but going unchecked, they start to, um, gather that kind of thinking. I had a, a case I worked on with a, a school district and they had a, a young child with special needs and the child was coming to school and saying all kinds of racist and, and sexually violent language. And the school psychologist was thinking, this doesn't um, make sense for the child's level of development. These words are not in their vocabulary or in their understanding. What they're saying in fourth grade doesn't match their life experience. Um, so as we talked, you know, we kind of understood or came to the realization that uh, it's highly likely they were hearing this kind of language at home and then reflecting it back at school, unknowing, not knowing uh, where it was coming from. But it served when they used racist language, when they used sexual violence language as a fourth grader um, on the school bus to motivate the other children to sort of pile on in bullying the person who was the the victim of this language. So it started to wear down other children's um, reluctance to be harsh and critical. Um, and, you know, I guess a good story in that example, the school actually brought the, the family in. I think the parent was a um, corrections worker and would come home and reflect a lot of the harsh speech they heard um, in the prison where they worked and were completely unaware that their, their young children were absorbing it. So um, I think in everything going on in society right now, it's, uh, it's helpful to reflect on where this stuff comes from. Um, and I think it's a, a type of ignorance. So if we keep going in the text, I'm going to try something a little radical and um, use this next section, the Defile States of Mind, um, as a roadmap for social change. So bear with me and see what you think of my theory. So, um, of course, Buddhist teaching. So, of course, it gives us a list and it numbers the list. How convenient. So the Defile States of Mind. Six kinds of Defile States of Mind conditioned by ignorance can be identified. It says six, but I think really you'll find there's four. So, but we'll go through here. First is the defilement united with attachment to Atman, from which those who have attained liberation in the Hinayana and those bodhisattvas at the stage of establishment of faith are free. So what does that mean? Um, Atman, if we recall, 
um, is an idea of a permanent self. So this section is saying what happens when ignorance is unchecked? What happens when the mind thus just builds up? And it says there's really these six um, defiled states of mind that result. So this attachment to a real and permanent self is the first problem. And that leads to a whole host of other issues and obstacles that we have to clear out, right? Additional dust on the mirror that we have to clean. Um, we've been told by the text that the cycle starts with ignorance. Um, so I'd like to offer another example where our idea of a self becomes an obstacle. So when we think of ourselves very rigidly, we cut off our ability to place ourselves in the shoes of another. So it's a way of cutting off our compassion. So if we think very rigidly, this is who I am, this is what I am, and we you know, heap extra label on top of ourselves. Um, to harken back to my, my younger days, you know, I have the jean jacket with all the different buttons for what I stand for. <laughs> um, and and we, we shudder to think of removing you know, any one of the buttons. We're just we're adding on buttons. Um, because that really, uh, you know, advertises who we are, um, that can be an obstacle. So um, in our current situation, um, as we look at protests around the world, I think attachment to Atman, no matter who we are, what side of the protest line we think we fall, um, we have a set idea about the other side. So we have a very strong idea about what the other side represents. Otherwise, I don't think we'd be protesting. So many of those ideas, though, are probably wrong. So we may have ideas about the protesters. We may have idea about their intentions. We may have ideas about law enforcement or the system, so to speak. Um, some of those ideas have to be wrong. They're probably wrong. So we have to be willing to soften our position to learn about the position and feeling of others. So the real dialogue can't start until we, you know, we open up our hearts to say, I want to know what the other position is. I'm willing to give up some of the thoughts about what I think the position of the others are. Um, so that's the first stage. So the text says, um, I scroll back up here. Um, the first of the defiled, first of the defiled, defilement united with the attachment from which those who have obtained liberation in the Hinayana and those bodhisattvas at the stage of the establishment of faith are free. So it's the stage of the establishment of faith. That's the very first beginning step. Um, so I think the very first beginning step for uh, real change as a result of the protests that we're seeing right now is we have to open ourselves up to the idea that um, way other people see us isn't 100% accurate. And the way that we see others or the way we see what we've labeled the problem can't be 100% accurate either. So we have to be open to that idea so that we can have real dialogue. So this text goes on. The second is the defilement united with the continuing mind from which those who are at the stage of establishment of faith and those practicing expedient means to attain enlightenment can gradually free themselves and free themselves completely at the stage of pure heartedness. So this one isn't as straightforward, but this is a rather coded reference to the stages of mind of the Bodhisattva set out in the Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, traditionally, this is where I would go on a long um, kind of side note to uh, discuss the Avatamsaka Sutra and those stages and how that's relevant, but that's what it's talking to. So to avoid kind of going too far afield, um, what this is asking us to is for us to try to avoid seeing and working with the defile states of mind. Um, that this is the wrong way to, to practice. We aren't getting rid of them as much as we are understanding them. So we're not ridding ourselves of the defiled state of mind. We are trying to really get to know it. So how do you get to know anything? How do you understand it? Um, you've got to sit down with it. You've got to understand it, invite it in, really 
talk to it. There has to be like real open dialogue with your mind and yourself. How did you get to this stage? How did you come to these ideas? Um, so this is the stage of establishing faith. From the perspective of um, you know our current social issues, I think we have to believe some change is possible. And if we don't think that change is possible, we can't affect change. So the first stage of establishing faith is we have to believe um, we can change, right? Otherwise, meditation isn't useful. We have to believe that there's a way for us to change. Otherwise, we can't invest our time and energy in these practices. So the stage of establishing faith is saying, I think I can change. I think I can have insight into my mind. I think these practices have some potential of paying off in that way. So that's the first stage of faith. The first stage of this kind of social change movement from, from this model is we have to believe that we can actually change the system. We have to believe that the violence against people can end. We have to believe that, um, you know, if we think that the problem is, you know, poor training of law enforcement, then we have to believe that more training will help. Otherwise, um, we, it's going to be very difficult to make changes. So this is my, how do we read kind of both uh, texts and situations together? If I can, a few magic clicks, we're back at the text. So the third is the defilement united with the discriminating analytical mind from which those at the stage of observing precepts begin to be liberated and finally are liberated completely when they arrive at the stage of expedient means without any trace. So this third stage is asking us why we observe precepts. And we observe precepts to dig up and expose underlying preconceived attitudes, assumptions, tendencies, and try to see those things more clearly. Um, when you promise not to do something, you become aware of all the times that you want to do it, and also all the times you don't do it. And if you reflect on why you wanted to do it, and then again, why you didn't do it, um, you can learn a lot about yourself. So that's really the purpose of the precepts. Um, I recall when I was in college, um, I, I would often hitch a ride to Ann Arbor because there was a Buddhist center there, a uh, Tibetan center called Jewel Heart. And uh, we went and um, they asked us to hold a, a precept for 24 hours and it was not listening to music. And for me at the time, it was easy because I didn't actually have anything that played music. So <laughs> I was a very poor college student. Um, but for other people, um, they found it incredibly difficult. And when we met back to discuss, um, you know, why it was hard for them or why they failed in holding that precept um, or that vow for 24 hours, the, the why was really deeply introspective. And I, if I remember correctly, one woman said she would always listen to music because it reminded her of her deceased father and she would find herself dancing, um, you know, swaying back and forth as she was washing dishes or doing something. And when she removed that music, it was, it brought up all that pain of the loss of her, of her loved one. Um, so the precepts aren't there because, you know, music is somehow bad. There's Buddhist music, right? We, we use music all the time. I'm, I'm surrounded by several musical instruments here, the bell being one of them. Um, it's why we're using it, what we're doing with it. So um, I think this one's helpful in um, thinking about making change right in the world. So the stage of observing precepts, whatever movement we get involved in or we start has to have some guidelines, right? Just like precepts, what we will do and what we won't do. We can't just say we have a, a movement for change and anything goes. Um, that, those guidelines have to be understood by ourselves and others. So if people want 
to reach across and say, we want to help you with your movement. We have to be able to articulate to them what it is the movement is doing and what it's for. So how do you change a system? You have to actually work within the system. Um, and you have to learn how the system works and what it responds to. And I suggest that this implies that we shouldn't burn the system down. Um, when the system feels threatened, uh, history teaches us it lashes out and tries to crush objectives. So how do we both work the system and work within it? And I think part of that is um, if we understand observing precepts as having some guidelines so we understand why the guidelines are there and what it's helping to guide us to do, right? So guidelines may be better for um, the precepts in many ways, right? They're guiding us towards something and away from something else. So I think that in our current um, state of the world can be helpful. I, I think a lot of times uh, we've seen social movements in the last 10 years or so, and sometimes they're not able to coalesce around um, specific goals and ways to achieve those goals. And it, it's hard oftentimes for the people who can make change to then articulate how that's going to come about. Go back to the text. The fourth is a subtle defilement disunited from the represented world of objects from which those at the stage of freedom from the world of objects can be freed. Um, what does this mean? It means the hardest thing to let go of is everything we know. We know very clearly the world of objects. We're sitting right now teaching and learning in the world of objects. So we have to do some meditation practice. Um, what we actually do, we have to do some meditation practice to drop out of the logical mind in order to experience this other mind, something that we experience. And I think experience is the key, something beyond logic, something beyond form that's really freeing. So this is the, I think, underlying teaching of that fourth stage. With regard to um, social change, we have a world of system symbols and appearance. We have to ask, can we transcend the role or position of the protester or can we transcend or change the position of being the man or part of the system wherever someone else perceives us to be? Um, if we ever only see ourselves on one side of an imagined divide, how do we change the world? What happens when the world changes? What do we protest, right? If we see ourselves only as the protester, do we then become the man that our younger selves protest against? Um, is our purpose change to, to be seen as change makers? Or are we really anarchists who act out of our angst on the system? Um, a system that will never make us happy. So I think in terms of social change, we have to really ask hard questions of ourselves um, in the same way that we have to ask hard questions of ourselves in spiritual practice. I don't see, I think the hard questions are equally as hard. Um, but we have to, I think, be, be really clear on, um, we can continue to protest, but there have to be some sort of incremental goals um, if we keep moving the goalpost, it's difficult to um, change the system, so to speak, and it's difficult to um, affect change. We're a society, we're a group of people, so there's always gonna be some system. Um, the only lack of system is when there's just one person, um, and then you still have your own system. But there has to be some sort of agreed upon norms or guidelines whenever there's a group of us so that's my my suggestion about the world of appearances and symbols so the fifth is the subtler defilement disunited from the evolving mind that perceives the defilement existing prior to the act of perceiving from which those at the stage of freedom from the evolving mind are free. What does this mean? So having to, we have to grasp 
grasp the mind that is able to see the space, the gap between perception, so that ability that we have to take information in, and our minds processing that information into labels, names, concepts, and categories. Um, it's, I'll describe it as a deep openness to all things. So an ability to just take it in. Um, I know some of them, especially in our country, a lot of times this experience was um, part of chemical use. We have a, a long history in Western uh, Buddhist practice of people discussing that uh, chemical or substance use and then having this experience. Um, I would offer that here's a text much older than most of the popular substances saying that this is possible uh, without their use and that their use is actually, or excuse me, that the state is actually a source of freedom. So if what we really want is freedom, then there's a method for that. With regard to um, social change, I think we need to, when we say freedom, we need to know what we're talking about. What is real freedom? I think in our country, we like, we, I think we define it as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and I think all too often, that's a very individual, my life, my liberty, my happiness. And we forget that those things are only possible when, um, well, in reliance on others. So, um, you know, as a constitutional, as an armchair constitutional scholar, um, it was not one or even a handful of individuals who came and um, wrote these charter documents for this nation. It was a pretty broad representation of people from all over the country. Granted, white land only land, land only men, um, so there's there are limitations at the time. But um, we had north and south. We had industrial areas and rural areas. We had people who were in it for different reasons. And um, I think sometimes today we think of freedom as a state of no rules, a state of you know doing anything I want, rather than asking how my life um, is supported, how my liberty is supported, and how my happiness comes to be and is supported. And I think as part of social change, we have to recognize that that is independence on everyone. It's not something that we can have um, apart from anyone. So that I think is very much in alignment with um, the Bodhisattva ideal that if we are not keeping in mind the well-being of all others, then we're really not on the spiritual path. So the last of those six, the six and most subtle is the defilement disunited from the basic activating mind from which those bodhisattvas who have passed the final stage and gone into the stage of Tathagatahood are free. So Tathagata is another word for Buddha. It's kind of interesting that they, it's Tathagatahood, so we have a Sanskrit word paired with an English phraseology, so that's interesting. So Tathagatas are free. So the sixth stage, um, stage of freedom, stage of Buddhahood. I think it's mentioned in this list not because it's a defiled state of mind, but it's something that we mythologize. Um, we think that's it. We've become Buddhas, we're done, it's over. You reach the goal. Um, I don't think Buddhas are done. They are just done with delusion. They still teach, it's hard work. Um, but I think there's an ease about it because they can see things more clearly. Um, I think this is you know, eventually the stage for um, our social protest. There's some stage of finality when we clearly see what the barriers to peace are and we can address them directly and clearly. I think, you know, if there's a Buddha in the world, they'd be able to cut very clearly to the, to the core and say, this is the problem. Um, they don't have to navigate the misinformation, the misunderstanding and the misdirection. 
So it's unobstructedly progressing. This would be maybe our social construct for it. So imagine what that looks like. Imagine uh, a Congress or even a Senate um, that clearly stands up and says, here's the clear problem with society, here's the clear solution, and we're gonna make this happen. Um, and I think it's beneficial to ask, where is the legislation after all the protests? Um, everybody knows what the problem is, but where's the actual change? Where's the leadership? What are the obstacles to that leadership? Um, I think if we review points one through four, especially, you could probably start with um, how people see themselves, right? So there's probably a senator right now saying, well, gosh, I was a prosecutor. I ran on a law and order platform and I was endorsed by a law enforcement agency. So if I stand up now and say, you know, this or that social problem is something that I want to tackle, am I going to get reelected? Um, so I think that's our our fundamental problem. Not that no one knows what the issues are. Not that no one knows that change needs to happen. Um, people are stuck very rigidly on stage one. They're so wrapped up in an idea of themselves, they can't see past that. So they can't get to any of the other stages. They can't even engage in dialogue or start to unwrap um, what the problems are and how they might get fixed and how to make change a reality. So that's my opinion. Feel free to disagree. But I thought it was helpful to um, link our text to um, what's going on in the world around us because um, it's everywhere. There's, there's no, no corner of the, the world that's not um, outraged. And I don't think we can ignore that right now. So I'm going to stop on the text there. Um, and before we go on to the meditation, I'll just ask, are there any questions? I'll be releasing that, uh, that talk as the, the Bodhisattva's Guide to Social Change. Just kidding. <laughs> but it, is, it is helpful to kind of think about some of these ideas and making uh, sense of this in terms of what's going on you know, in our current moment. I have a question, something. Sure. Um, so when I'm finding it slightly challenging sometimes discussing uh, uh, current events and the protests of fighting anti-Black racism in yes. police systems, and um, I'm just wondering, what's this, the skillful way to de deal with people who are reactionary to calm, open dialogue? I'm not talking being in their face or anything, but just inviting conversation and then getting shut down. Um, because the social justice part of me doesn't want to say nothing. Like, I don't want to be complicit and silent, but I also don't want to call, I don't want to lose my audience by um, saying things that they don't want to hear at the same time. You, do you know what I mean? Like, th there's like a threshold. Yes. Where you lose somebody's um, curiosity. Um. I feel like this pertains to Buddhism. No, <laughs> like it, it does. No, 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 because it's, um, you know, the quickest way to destroy your samadhi is anger. And the sutras are very clear about that. In fact, it's, it's often described as the moment a thought of anger arises, you know, all of your, your practice is extinguished um, because it's such a powerful emotion. So um, we're talking about you know, the Buddha faced this. There were times when he had to face um, war and killing and try to dialogue with people. Um, 
the, the greatest example of that from the actual Buddhist lifetime probably is the water wars where there was uh, members of his own clan willing to kind of go to war over water rights um, for field irrigation and things like that because it, 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 it got so spun up with, you know, who did the water belong to and um, who should have control of it. They were ready to go to war, right? So they were past name calling. They were past oppressing one another. And they, were, they were out in the fields ready to go at it. And um, the Buddha was actually able to discuss with them, you know, that they cared about people and they knew that they, there were people on the other side that cared about their own children and families and things like that as well. Um, so I think the best way is to try to humanize the experience of others for those people who may be resistant to it. Um, so, you know, asking how would, how would they feel if it's an established part of their community that they have to discuss with their children how to be safe around police? Um, have they ever had to do that? Um, do they believe that all black children get the, the talk? Um, I posted on Facebook today. Not only did I get the talk from my parents, I got it in sixth grade from my social studies teacher. Um, that was an accepted part of my grade school curriculum growing up in an all black community. So um, when people, and I, I believe when it's personalized, people hear it more than they hear generalized um, conversation or accusation. So when you talk from your own personal experience, I, in, in almost every case, um, people hear that and they reflect on it more than they reflect on some kind of generalized social movement or something like that. So if, um, um, Most of you know, I went to law school here in Oregon um, and our criminal law professor um, teaching to a 99% Caucasian class talked about her experience as a prosecutor. And when she would do um, pro bono cases for prisoners and that involved going up from Arizona and Utah and driving all you know back roads where these prisons were and uh, she told the story of law enforcement finding out about that and not taking too kindly to these young attorneys coming and taking the cases of prisoners that were wrongly um, imprisoned. Um, and they got stopped late at night on a road and she got very angry and was like, they can't do this and our rights and this and that. And she was black and she was reminded by all her other three um, white colleagues that it would be better for her to be, remain quiet so they could all go home alive. Um, and they feared for her to be alone in that circumstance. That made an impression on the class of people who largely hadn't had that experience because it was personal. Um, they had come to respect her and respect her scholarship. And so when she told the story, they didn't question the experience. Um, so I think making it, you know, when it's, when it's personal and not the sort of generalized, you know, well, you ought to, you know, care more about other people. It, it people hear it as you're telling me, I don't care about people. You know, it, again, that sense of self pushes back very strongly. Um, but when it's humanized, I think it, it works. Um, I try my best not to post anything political, but I, I did post something on Facebook today about, um, George Floyd's murder and the resulting, um, calls for social change. Um, and one of the people that responded is somebody that I worked with who's, um, 25 odd year in law enforcement and before that served in Vietnam as a Marine, the Marine Corps. I have a lot of respect for him and what he's done. Um, 
and he is a mountain of a man. He's huge. I feel small when I'm around him. <laughs> and uh, we definitely have different ideas about society. But whenever we talked face to face, we always came away um, in agreement and had a very clear understanding of each other's position. And um, I always strove to bring it down to caring about people. Um, and I think sometimes those messages get lost in rhetoric. They get lost in fiery news television shows that just, you know, one way or another. Um, but I think when you humanize it rather than attack, that's when people listen. Um, that's the tactic I, I try to take now. Um, because if I don't, I, I give energy to anger and I'm not, I'm, I'm not working with anger now. I want to work with other, other energy. <laughs> so rather than be, uh, angry, I have to think about, you know, what led to the, you know, that person's ignorance. What I try to reflect on what, what was their life experience that they have these opinions? Um, how unfortunate, right. For them. Um, and I try to focus on, on that perspective and it's something you have to work at. Um, there was a lot of racial injustice when I was growing up and it was very overt and I found myself at about 15 recognizing that um, it's probably one of the reasons I became Buddhist but I recognized I was going to become consumed by this anger right society was going to win and turn me into something that it stereotypically wanted me to be or I could um, cultivate a different focus. So um, does it sadden me to see, um, and we've had no shortage of examples on television from Ahmaud Arbery um, to the man bird watching in Central Park to George Floyd to, I mean, there's so many people and only because we have video cameras or we're watching it on TV, um, I'm sad about it. It hurts to watch. It's um, incredibly disheartening. Um, but we need to take our response and think about what, what are we going to do about it rather than just be angry about it. There's always going to be someone who's going to disagree. And some people are just going to disagree because they get a rise out of other people and they know that throwing gas on the flames is going to I honestly have seen this and heard um, they know it's a distraction. So that's why they do it. So we have to not take the bait, the, 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 the bait and find other ways to um, work at it. So um, it's hard. I'm not going to say it's easy. It's very hard um, for myself. Anger was the, most difficult thing to work on being young and, and starting Buddhist practice. And I think as Americans, um, outrageous anger is the thing that um, kind of pushes us sometimes too far one direction. So we, we think, well, my anger is justified. Um, or my favorite, the bumper sticker. If you're not angry, you're not paying attention, right? <laughs> um, so there is something you can be shocked. You can be outraged. I think all of those things without addressing anger. Um, and I should be angry after Trayvon Martin was killed when he was murdered. In my opinion, I stopped wearing hooded sweatshirts. I used to like to go for jogs early in the morning when it was cold and would wear a hooded sweatshirt. I'd no longer felt comfortable doing that. I should be angry.
but I was incredibly sad for his family. And I wanted people to um, see the injustice and, you know, hopefully we could focus on the laws that, that led to that. Um, you know, there's no shortage um, of these examples. And so I personally change my behavior because of what's happening in society. So, but I'm, if I generate anger, um, two things are going to happen. One, law enforcement is going to stop me and there's going to be a negative interaction and I'm going to have less likelihood of exiting, exiting that interaction alive. So that's not helpful for me. Um, but two, I'm undermining my own practice and, um, I can be angry all I want to be. And that's not going to hurt the other person. That's not going to change their behavior. In fact, it's going to, you know, um, they're going to double down on their ideas and stereotypes because of my reaction. So it has to be different. Um, and I can effectively change more minds by not responding with anger. Um, but it's very difficult. It's very difficult. So, um, this is not something that happens magically overnight. Isn't, isn't, it, isn't it different to feel anger versus responding with anger though? From a meditative perspective, no. So we should actually be um, looking very clearly at the moment, you know, the anger begins to arise and then just not attaching to it. Um, that is, um, that is hard, um, but it is possible. So I, not too far away from here, two, three weeks ago, I was walking and it was in the middle of, uh, kind of three weeks or so into, you know, the COVID quarantine and just had to take a walk, get some fresh air, been inside too long and a car full of young men, you know, were yelling racial slurs out the window at me. Um, and I laughed. One, because they were revving the engine so fast to get away, I couldn't quite hear everything they said. So I thought you kind of undermined your own uh, racial attack. <laughs> but then they, they took off, you know, really fast um, as if I could chase down a car or something. Um, so I, I, I laughed at the senselessness of it all right here. The whole world is worried about their health. Um, you know, stores are closed, schools are closed, um, to protect them only because schools are closed. Could they be out in, you know, 12 o'clock in order to, to do this drive by screaming. Um, and then I thought, that's funny. They couldn't even do it right. So I, I couldn't even hear the, the full insult. Um, so, um, I find it, it saddens me that we still have this going on, but, um, I'm not angry. Uh, who am I going to be angry at? Right. Their parents who taught them that behavior, their peers, um, the society, cause they're, they're kids. They're just reflecting, you know, what they think is the thing to say and acting out in a way that will score them points with their peers. Why am I angry at them? Um, it's just unfortunate. So I have to hope that, you know, they'll have that wake up moment, but it is difficult to cultivate, but I do it because, um, when I, like I said, it was a nonstop uh, onslaught of this kind of thing when I was younger. And I recognized then it was going to consume me or I was going to become somebody I didn't recognize. So um, maybe through working on it earlier, it got easier. But the flip side is when I see things like um, 
what happened to Mr. Floyd, it touches me much more deeply. So um, when I was younger and angry, I didn't, I didn't allow myself to feel. Um, I was tough. Yeah, I was a tough guy. Um, and now when I see that, you know, tears come to my eyes. So it touches me more deeply. I feel it more deeply. Um, I'd rather be this person than the angry guy. But it takes a lot of practice. And uh, some people don't believe that. But honestly, that was the level of anger was scary for me. So that's why I tried to work on it. Insane. Yes. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where there was an invisible but very definite uh, divide between uh, in the city. So um, I grew up with that always around me, and it, I had to make a discernible effort not to, to buy into that, to not be racist, because everybody around me was racist. And I've, I'm so much happier that I didn't buy into that and I didn't have to shed that in later years. Um, and it was so sad to see the, the way that it's just the mindset in the South. Um, it, it's something that is going to take so much effort to overcome for people. Yeah, it really does take a lot of um, a lot of effort. So, actually, my best friend from high school re reached out today, and um, she's Caucasian. I think all of her friends in high school were black, um, and she recognized that you know in the working world, um, she has ignored kind of microaggressions and subtle racist comments because it's just easier to go about her job that way. And now she feels really guilty about it. And she feels like she's enabled that behavior. Um, and so she, she reached out and she's like, how do I address it? Because in high school, she had been the first person to spin around and scream at somebody um, because it was not socially acceptable. Her group of friends was not socially acceptable to the school and the community. Um, it was a bit of a scandal that, um, a girl who did so well academically would associate with us. <laughs> so, um, but I think she recognized she got older and, you know, you try to work up the corporate ladder and this kind of thing. And, um, and she now feels like it's something she enabled. Um, so it's, it's difficult, right? You have to, you definitely have to pick your battles. Um, and I think you have to, the greatest lesson my teacher ever gave me was to know your capacity. And um, his observation was a lot of people in the West really want to do a lot of very um, specialized Buddhist practice. And they want to learn new techniques, all these new techniques. And, you know, well, I read about this special technique, I want to learn it. He says, so they end up learning a lot of you know, practices, but they don't have a good foundation. So they have a very small foundation and then they think they go up very high, they very easily can topple over. So he said it's much better to focus on the basics and make sure you have a really, really strong foundation and always go back to those basic practices. And um, I think he was right because in order to absorb all of the um, horrible things that we see in the news and the horrible things that we see in our communities and we might hear from even friends and family. Um, you have to have a very broad foundation. So um, that's going to be different for all of us though. Um, you know, I was born into this. I was born into uh, people looking at me a certain way or running away. And, you know, I, I, I was tall early. And so initially I was perceived a certain way. And um, my entire family's from Mississippi. So 
the stories are endless. I have nothing to complain about compared to <laughs> what they tell me happened. Um, so I think when you grow up with it, um, one, you start to develop capacity for it sooner. And um, two, I think you have to make a choice because you have a lot of examples. Um, if you're a minority in this country, you have a lot of examples of either people who have um, borne that burden with dignity and you have every community has examples of someone who is consumed by the anger. And um, I had family members who were consumed by the anger and I didn't want to, I didn't want to be them. Um, I had friends of all races as a young child. Um, some of them decided they didn't want to be friends anymore, but I didn't expect that that was the case for everybody. But um, some people did, but I didn't want to make that sweeping generalization. But it is a choice, like you said, right? You have to work on it early. You have to develop conscious awareness of it. But um, we really have to be aware of what it does to us. It really upsets our own um, balance, our own meditation, our sleep, our health. Um, there's plenty of things that can damage our health. Me holding on to emotions about other people's opinions is one of the few things that's in my control. I can eat more healthy. <laughs> I can let go of this anger <laughs> and that's good. I can't, I don't have immediate control of air quality and you know, other things I got to go out in the street and demonstrate. But, um, the things that are in my control, I want to try to control, but I'm, I'm outraged. I'm incredibly sad and, um, but I'm not going to be angry, but those energies are things we're going to channel into change. Um, and I, those, that's also what we have to work on because it's a, it's a daily challenge. It's a daily challenge. Any other? I just want to say thanks, Sensei, for for answering. Oh yeah. With, with all of that, um, it's possible. Really, you helpful. know, grew up in the most segregated city in America, Detroit, and I survived it. And I'm not angry about it. It's it's something that helps me understand other people's um, experience. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Well, it is 8.30. I don't want to keep everybody all night long because I'm sure some of you probably still need to eat today. <laughs> or uh, there's some light left. So maybe others of you will be carrying protest signs. Uh, <laughs> yet this evening. Um, I just want to say I want everybody to stay safe, both for our ongoing struggle with coronavirus. And um, I will say I'm very proud of my Dharma brother, uh, Imanaka Sensei, for engaging in protests in Seattle today. And he posted that on Facebook. Um, so we can be productive. We can be outraged. We can fight the system. Um, and we can do it in deeply connected and compassionate ways. And I, I encourage all of us to think about how that can be accomplished. Um, I, I try to give some examples this evening, but I think we all have to start with um, looking at ourselves, how we see ourselves in this and why we see ourselves that way. Um, and what, what we put first when we describe ourselves. Um, and I think that that might inform how we advocate for change because we do need change. 
this has to change. We also have to change. So that's why we practice. So thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for all your questions. Um, thanks to everybody else just for being present and uh, listening. And as always, if there's something you wanted to ask, feel free to ask or comment offline if you didn't want it uh, to say it out loud, I understand. But please stay safe. Uh, we'll see you next week, but we also have the, um, the movie or documentary discussion coming up this weekend. So if you have opportunity to take part in that, I, I look forward to seeing you then. So thank you. Have a good evening.